All right, so welcome everyone to our first breakout session. We have a nice treat to uh, kick off the, the afternoon. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, too much about uh, Dr. Mansur Hasib. Um, his bio is, is on the website, um, is all over LinkedIn, um, so he needs no introduction whatsoever. Um, but he is going to talk about cybersecurity leadership. So I'm going to leave the floor for the next 20 minutes to Dr. Mansur Hasib. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you very much for... Thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining this session. What I'm going to talk about really are these three things. First, I'm going to help you understand the concept of cybersecurity leadership and why that is important, and in some ways how that is tied to governance. The second thing is people. Why are people important? Because too many people in the cybersecurity field think about technology first. And that's been part of the problem, that they have been so focused on the technology and they've forgotten about the people. And so we have all these massive problems. And then the third thing, which I believe that will be very relevant to you, which is that how do you develop culture? So that is the key takeaway I would like for this session. It's a 20 minute session, so we can't spend too much time on it. So first of all, let's understand cybersecurity. Similar to information governance, cybersecurity has three primary goals. One is confidentiality. That simply means that authorized people have access to information. Unauthorized people do not have access to information. And the authorized people could be inside the organization or outside the organization. It doesn't matter. They don't have to be in China. They don't have to be in Russia. Similarly. The concept of integrity simply means that the information is trustworthy. The reason you focus on the trustworthiness is because you make decisions based on the information. So if the information is faulty, then your decisions will be faulty, and therefore the integrity of information is very, very sacred. Now, as part of the integrity, there are also these concepts of authentication and non-repudiation. With authentication, you simply have to prove that you are who you are, and therefore you have access to whatever information it is that you're going to access. Because if you're not authorized to access that information, you shouldn't be accessing that information. Similarly, non-reputation simply means that there is traceability, and I can trace who sent the message, who changed the message, and there is complete non-repudiation of the source of the message. So that's integrity, very important concepts. The third key thing is the concept of availability. Availability means that the information, notice that I've moved away from systems. In the past, we used to talk more about systems, but today information actually resides not just on systems, they also reside in people's heads. So we have to worry about information in all its modes, whether it's on paper, in technology, or in people's head, we have to worry about that. So it's focused is on the information. So the availability of the information has to be there as planned. So a lot of people, when I asked them about availability is, and I said, should you be available all the time? And they quickly fall into the trap and they say, yes, of course. But that's not true, because you plan availability. Sometimes you want the systems to be available or the information to be available, say, Monday through Friday, or not available in the non-contiguous states of the United States. So you might have geographic restrictions, all kinds of restrictions. Okay, So availability as planned. Now, how do you do this? You have to have three tools, people, policy, and technology. Now, a lot of people talk about process. Process comes after policy, actually. In my opinion, process is, a, is subservient to policy only because policy is an overarching concept which then is proceduralized, or how you implement that policy is where the procedures and the processes come in. So I wouldn't jump to procedure and process until I've done the policy. How are we going to do this? We have to establish the rules of the road. All right, and then, of course, technology. Now, why are people important? So, so this, this part 
we all understood, right? Why are they important? They're important because of this concept of time, because governance, cybersecurity, none of these things are a state. They are a continuously evolving process, right? So evolving process means innovation, improvement over time. And that is why this box, as you see, is smaller on the left and larger on the right. In other words, it's trying to portray that as you progress over time, you will be improving. Now, think about that for a second and hold that thought. Now let's go, if we are going to do a cybersecurity strategy or anything, we just talked about information strategy. Similarly, cybersecurity strategy, whatever strategy. What is going to guide us? So one of the, some of the key concepts that guide us are the mission of the organization. Why does that organization exist? So for example, the strategy for a healthcare organization may will be different than say an education organization or a mom and pop pizza shop, Domino's Pizza, you name it. Mission has to drive your strategy. So that's the first thing. What are you trying to achieve? And then does your strategy enhance the mission? One of the key things about strategy is it can never block the mission. If your strategy is strangling the mission somehow and preventing you from progressing, that strategy is no good. Then, risk management. How do you evaluate between strategies? How do you prioritize which one I'm gonna do year one, year two, so on and so forth. So we have to talk about the concept of risk. And risk is of two types. You have positive risk, which if you take will give you huge benefits. And then you have negative risks, which if something bad happens, you will suffer tremendous losses. So a lot of people, when they talk about risk, they're only thinking about the damages, but they're not thinking about the positive risk. But if you are a true cybersecurity professional, you're going to evaluate risks both ways. Most risk managers that we, even financial risk managers, they calculate risk both ways. So cybersecurity professionals, information governance professionals, regardless of what field you're in, if you are involved in risk analysis, and risk assessment, you should be looking at holistic risks. Then comes the key concept of governance, which all of you are very good at. And that is setting up that, the, the culture of how things are going to work. A lot of people confuse governance with control. They think the governance means, I tell you what to do and you do what I tell you to do. But if you do it that way, what will happen? You will stifle innovation. So governance must actually enable innovation. A key, a simple example that I'll give you is, think of a car. A car is actually a pretty risky instrument or engine machine, right? It could kill us. But the positive benefit, the value that we derive from driving that car means that we will still take the risk to drive the car. So what do we do? We start to minimize the risk in a variety of ways. The vehicle manufacturer gives us some tools. They give us airbags, they give us seat belts, and so on and so forth. But we still have to use them. We have to learn how to use them. We have to turn them on. We, don't, we can't disable things. As you probably know, we can disable airbags if we choose to, right? We can choose not to wear our seat belts. So, and the governance part comes in where we're driving on the highway all together in one direction. Well, what if people decided to drive every which way? We would have major accidents and lots of deaths and things like that. We have that right now. When people run the red light, they kill a lot of people. And that's because they're violating the rules of the road. But you see, that's where governance comes in. And in that governance concept, there's also the concept of innovation. Don't you always keep learning? You might make a mistake sometime, but you keep learning from that mistake. So governance has to enable that. So that is cybersecurity in an essence. And what I have done is I have provided for you a formal academic definition of cybersecurity that 
encompasses the entire model. Because a lot of cybersecurity professionals, you will see them, they're, they're going out and talking at conferences and using the word cybersecurity, but never defining what they mean. Sometimes they are only thinking of network attacks or things on the network. To a cybersecurity professional, it doesn't matter whether it's network, non-network, or in people's heads, as I said. Information is information. So the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the information has to be important to us at all times. So we are going to try to maximize that according to the goals, but we are going to focus on the mission. Notice on the very first line, what do I say? Cybersecurity is the mission-focused and risk-optimized governance of information, which maximizes confidentiality, integrity, and availability using a balanced mix of people, policy, and technology while perennially improving over time. Notice that we have now captured everything from that model into this one single simple definition. I'm a big, my philosophy is definitions have to be simple, they have to be in plain English language so that everybody can understand it. And it can't be a one big paragraph definition either. It needs to be short and sweet. So that's my definition. Now I evolved with this to this definition over several, peer, several years. The reason is I'm a perennial learner just like any of you. The original definition that I first came, attempted in 2014 when I published the first edition of my book, Cybersecurity Leadership, this definition was different. It was a little bit more cumbersome. And I wasn't using the word governance at that time. I was using the word management. And I realized that management is a bad word because management tends to stifle innovation, whereas leadership does the exact opposite. Because this is what leadership does. So I realized the big difference between leadership and management is that leadership is trying to govern people in a way that they are developing a culture of perpetual innovation. So I have explained cybersecurity in many conferences now by simply saying, look, cybersecurity is nothing more than people-powered perpetual innovation. That's it. People-powered perpetual innovation. Now, why people? Because people are the only source of innovation. People also choose the technology that you're going to buy. So if you have the wrong people, you'll probably buy the wrong technology. And that happens all the time. A lot of these people will say, oh, I spent so much money on this. This is a money pit. But you see, it's not money that makes the difference. It's your smart use of that money. And that's where people come in. People also configure the technology because just buying the technology is not sufficient. Right? When you buy when you buy the technology, you have to configure the technology the appropriate way. A good example is Target, right? When Target implemented their FireEye systems and all that, they simply implemented it to inform and not block anything. That was a conscious choice, which is okay. But once you decide that that's the way your technology is going to be configured, you also have to do something with that information. When that technology informs you, you have to have a governance structure that tells you how you're going to act each time you get some piece of information, right? And they didn't have that. That was their problem. So you will see that that is the problem most of the time. So this is why leadership is very, very important. And the leadership starts from the CEO level because the CEO is really responsible for whatever executives you're going to hire. Right now, a lot of people are talking about the Equifax breach and they're bad mouthing a lot of people. But you see, responsibility goes to the very top. And unfortunately, so far, many of the CEOs really haven't been held accountable. And that's because many of our laws and regulations are in that particular area of accountability is still kind of weak. So this is the key slide for why we need leadership. Because leadership, one of the first things it will do 
is it will engage all the brains in an organization. You do not want to run an organization with the brains of a single individual, however smart that person may be. Right? If you have a thousand people in your organization, all thousand of those people are capable of innovating. And I just told you that they will select the technology. But the other amazing thing that people do is micro-innovation, which is that each person taking responsibility of their job and then improving on that job by learning, as you are doing. You're coming to conferences, you're continuously learning, and you're taking back back, and you're making what? Micro-innovations. Very low risk. Micro-innovations are very low risky, but you have to do that. Toyota does it, does it this way. Some, some of the greatest companies do lots and lots of micro-innovation. They don't do macro-innovations, which generally bets the entire company on that innovation. If that innovation fails, the company will go down the tubes. That's not a great way to innovate. Innovation inherently is risky, right? You've never done this before, so you don't know if it's going to work or not. The other thing is that when people feel that their brains are being used and they're being valued, that generates loyalty and allegiance and more innovation. Because the problem is that if your people aren't loyal to you, what are you going to have? You're going to have insider attacks. And insider attacks aren't just solved by surveillance. They're solved by loyalty. Because too much surveillance will actually cut down innovation. If you feel like Big Brother is watching every bit of your actions, you will stop doing things. Because who makes no mistakes? Somebody who does nothing will not make any mistakes. Who doesn't say anything wrong? Somebody who says nothing will say nothing wrong. And that's exactly what will happen to your organization with too much surveillance. So what do you do? This is what you do. Build a culture. So I said this was the third thing that I was going to talk about, and that is culture. So culture, there are four elements. All of this literature is out there in the culture on literature. In the cybersecurity information governance realm, you should look up Laura Corris. She was one of the first that I started reading about, but this whole culture literature comes from way back when. So the first important thing about culture is a set of values, regardless of what they may be. And the value could be integrity, teamwork, customer service, it doesn't matter. Three, four key values that you embrace and you say every worker, every employee must embrace those values, live them, and do work that way. And leadership could be a value too, right? Empowerment could be a value. Early in my career, I worked at a nuclear power plant. That was one of the first places where I transformed an organization from the mainframe world to the network world. And one of the key values of that plant was safety. Everybody was living, breathing safety. If somebody said something is going to be unsafe, no supervisor could make that person do it. There would be a tribunal, there would be a discussion, and then there would be a decision made on what, it, what would be done. So that's how important values and culture are. Then rituals. Why do we need rituals? Rituals are very simple things. These are things like celebrating people who are, say, living certain values or certain things. So for example, employee of the month certificate parking spot, a cover, uh, I mean, your picture on the web page. These are all kinds of rituals that people can go through to reinforce the culture. And then, of course, the heroes. The heroes, once again, we as humans want to be heroes. We want to strive to be heroes. We want to honor the heroes, but at the same time that we're honoring the hero heroes, we want to be like the heroes also. So heroes are also the, those kinds of people that are living the values that you want the company organization to embrace. So that's why they're important. And then the social network, preventing deviations. This is the teamwork environment. So when a new person comes into your environment, 
how do you indoctrinate that person? Hey, this is the way we do it. And when they start deviating, you say, hey, that's not the way we do it, et cetera, et cetera. That's the social network. And these are very powerful. So ultimately, why is this important? Because ultimately, your culture will determine behavior. If integrity is not in your culture of your organization, guess what? You're going to have problems. And in a lot of companies, they have never even thought about embracing culture or, or values or anything like that. So it's very important. And basically, we are at that 20 minutes. And so this is the summary, which is that what I just shared with you is that at the bottom line, cybersecurity is simply people-powered innovation. What you want to do with your governance is not control. What you want to do is leadership. And leadership simply has to inspire that innovation. Cybersecurity, information governance, none of this is a one-brain sport. We need all the brains that are in the organization. And leadership doesn't come from a position. Everybody is a leader. Every human being who says, hey, I know something, and I want to teach you. So we talked about that in the, in the, in the, in the first session also, which is that teaching is, is, is very important. Each one of you are teachers, right? Everything that you learn, you want to go and share that with somebody. And it's also fun. Teaching is fun. I mean, the fun that I have teaching the thousands of students that are now going through my classrooms, it is just so satisfying. Now, I, this, this is my contact information. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. You're welcome to visit my website. And that's where my book is now competing for a induction into the Hall of Fame. So if you vote for the book, this is a People's Choice Award, just like we had the Information Governance Awards and all these People's Choice categories. So now they have a book award that's going on, and my book is competing for that. And a lot of what I just shared with you is shared in great detail in that book. So I thank you very much for your kind attention and for inviting me here. <laughs>